Rob, great to talk to you. It's yep. been a while when when we trained in person. I think it's three years, three years three now. Years. Yep. I think it yep. was March, March yep. 2020 when we trained in Germany together. So um, great to have you here. Talk to you about some, I think, pretty interesting topics. And uh, I think we will have we will cover a lot. We will have a lot of episodes because I think we always talk a lot and very deep. So yeah. um, I think there is a lot of stuff. I think it's great to to start a series with you, an introduction of you, and um, just tell us how you started with the martial arts training. How was your first? What was your first martial arts, and how you found out about internal training, and later about Akusawa Sensei? So, okay. Well, I mean. I guess a little bit about me is so I'm half Japanese and um, so my yeah I always wanted to do martial arts yeah I watched Karate Kid when I was a kid and then I wanted to do karate so I did karate I went to like the most of us yeah in the 80s <laughs> <laughs> and and I so I went to this karate class in the community college and I asked the teacher I was like so is the crane kick like a real thing? <laughs> he was like, what kind? What kind of karate style it was? Was it Goju Ryu or was it something else? Or I have no idea. It was. <laughs> it, it was well. All, all I know is that they were they used sai, and the reason I know that is because my mother pulled me out because she saw the instructor and the assistant instructor using nunchaku and sai. So she was like, "It's so violent." <laughs> it's like there's no way that you know like it's written empty hand karate there's no no it's probably not real or something i'm just like that doesn't seem right but okay and then she put me in kendo instead you know because uh -huh. you know it's like you wear armor and you bash each other upside the head with like bamboo sticks that's so not violent but whatever <laughs> So I did pretty that. Pretty rare in Germany. You you can't kendo is pretty rare. You know, I, I don't think there even for kids. I don't think there is kendo for kids here in Germany. I don't yeah, know, but, but you have you have judo, right? Is yeah, of course. Yeah. That's that's pretty big here. Yeah. She and my mom did judo, but she was like, I don't want you getting like bow legged. <laughs> so. <'cause, laughs> yeah. And uh, but uh, yeah, so I did a little bit of kendo when I was a kid, and then uh, I moved to Japan when I was a kid from about fourth to eighth grade and then uh, did some there and then came back and spent high school in the States. And I didn't really do much martial arts when I was in high school, but then I picked it back up when I was in college where I was doing Kendall. And that's when I just, there was a Polish guy who was doing these like really cool looking forms. And I asked him, you know, what are you doing? And he said, Oh, I'm doing this thing called Tanlang. Tang Lang Men. I was like, what's that? It's like, oh, it's this mantis, like Chinese northern style of, of you know, he called it Chinese boxing. <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's interesting. Um, yeah, and I, I, I ended up joining, not knowing what I was getting myself into. So that was the 90s. So wasn't wasn't UC just coming up? And wasn't, wasn't it just a, was jiu-jitsu a, a hot thing? Or was it still not known to the to the most uh, martial artists uh, martial art community in the US. Oh, so because it was yeah. No, no, I I watched the UFC cuz you know, you could uh -huh. rent it at Blockbuster. And yeah, then, right? And uh there were a bunch of uh jiu-jitsu guys training right before our kendo session in mm -hmm. college and they were all like basically uh ex-wrestlers <laughs> uh -huh. which i think was what it attracted at the time you know yeah yeah um it's it's a it's a really stark difference from the kind of people that you see doing jujitsu now which is like you see like a lot of actually like programmers and like you know, in silicon yeah. Valley, like coders everybody does jujitsu now you know yeah it was it was more 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 rough and more more towards valetudo and and and, and uh, you know real fighting challenge matches so it was more yes. more for the tough really tough 
guys and now it's yeah. really like like guys like Miki Muzumichi who are really uh, smart intelligent guys but no yeah. fighters in a sense but right. very very good high level jiu-jitsu practitioners yeah that's changed because I still remember the advertisements for like Mario Sperry and like, yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah so um you know uh so I, I was training this Chinese boxing under un, under Chris and you know it was his name and what struck me was that he moved very differently from, I guess, some of the Kung Fu, what the Westerners that I saw doing Kung Fu. He moved mm -hmm. more like the mainlanders. And then it turned out he, he was, was he was learning directly from the source in China or yes. in the US or yeah. directly from the uh -huh. source from uh, Yu Tian Cheng, I think. So a guy from Yang, Yantai. Uh -huh. And, um, you know, we did a lot of. Um, like single single drills single single pattern drills then that led up to sparring slap sparring and then eventually him putting on these like gloves that weren't really gloves they were just like thin strips of plastic covering his knuckles <laughs> so no 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 big protective gear just no hot for sparring but well no but he was very 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 careful about um uh, building up skills so he never hurt us unnecessarily although like you know he told me like one time he's like you have to keep your elbow down if you don't keep your elbow down this is going to be bad he's like i'm going to nail you he called him serving hamburgers because he was like he'd give you a body hook and he called him <laughs> serving hamburgers and he hit me in the floating rib because he was like look i'm only going to tell you like two times <laughs> <laughs> After I got hit once, I dropped like a sack of potato. I just like, it was just like, it, it was really intense. Uh -huh. And But that uh, was a pure, pure external style, you would say, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, so I would say, yeah, external, except he forced us to think about the physics about it. And he was, uh, so the, the Tan Lang is big on the use of the waist. And the waist mm -hmm. is that in waist in Chinese martial arts also encompasses the Dantian. And mm -hmm. when you and when I watch his his teacher move, he's definitely connected, Yu Tian Cheng. And mm -hmm. Chris was also connected. He, I mean, he wasn't nearly as connected as say like Akuzawa Sensei, but um I got lucky in that sense that he forced me to think about the mechanics and how to use the waist, how the waist is attached. To the arms and when mm -hmm. i think about it the way that their conditioning exercises were created they have a paired exercise where you stretch your arms out and the other person stretches their arms out and you both push against each other and you have to connect your arm mm -hmm. through your shoulder to your waist so you have to tie your your arm to your abdomen so yeah it's external but external still means you still have to use all that connective tissue it's not mm -hmm. just, yeah, it's not simple physics, I guess you could say. Yeah. And then how you made the switch, how you changed from, from something external to to something internal. Or did you just, just switch when you met Akusawa or did you some internal training before? No, I, so I was actually, true, I, where did I meet Yenny? So I met, I met Sam Chin's daughter, uh, Yenny um at i forget something and we were like pushing hands a bit and she's like oh you're pretty good and then they're like oh you should meet her dad he's like a tai chi master it's like a tai chi master yeah i was like in the bookshop you read those like books by like young jing yeah. or something and it's like you hear all this stuff there's some a lot of like stuff that you're just kind of you raise your eyebrows like is this for real but you know so yeah you know, i went down and um i went to meet sam but he wasn't there and instead, his top student, Dave, was there. And, you know, he started, he's just like, we start doing this, the the rolling hands that they do. And I, I start stepping. He's like, oh, you can step. Oh, that's good. So you have, you have, you know how to step. You got a good martial arts background. You know how to use the qua. I'm like, what the hell is the qua? He's, like, <laughs> he's using all this terminology. And then he's like, but I have your upper center. I have your lower center. And I was like, what the hell? I can't move. Why am I frozen in place? It was just a really odd feeling. So, 
Yeah, yeah it's, it's very uh, Sim Chim is very very famous here in Germany too. So um, yeah, yeah. And then you met him actually. You trained with him. Yes. Yep. Yep. I trained with him. Um, very very very, um, very nice guy. Always was sharing the knowledge because he didn't believe in keeping secrets because he he basically said secrets hide themselves. And it's like mm-hmm. I can teach you guys, but. Yeah, I can teach you all. I can share all the secrets, but I know most of you aren't going to actually train it anyway. So yeah, that's that's something I, I've I've realized with a lot of, especially with, with internal martial arts at seminars. Or something there are a lot of people who just don't want to train hard. They just want to drink the 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 cool aid and and and, and don't want to train hard. I remember uh, one story. I was at a seminar from some internal martial arts teacher, and we did some exercise where we had to put the the fist just put on the chest you know mm-hmm. and nothing 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 hard and the guy said to me uh, could you do the the fist a little bit softer it hurts me and i was like man <laughs> <laughs> what, what are you are talking about we're doing the martial arts seminar here how you can say uh and i wasn't even i mean i was not being a jerk or something i was yeah. just putting the fist on on the chest and he was like yeah that's that's strange when, when, when you think about these kind of guys wanting to learn something you know to fight so yeah <laughs> well um uh, I'm I'm not going to say the the, uh, the individual's name but I I remember you saying you weren't very impressed with the specific individual because you said uh I just think that a lot of these guys they've never met somebody who's actually strong. <laughs> it's like Yeah, 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 know. true, true. I think uh, I think a lot of of, of guys who are coming from at least in Germany, you know, coming from Aikido or coming from from Tai Chi, they never have experienced how athletic some good martial artist with just background in wrestling or jiu-jitsu or boxing or, or kickboxing could be. So I think that in a sense, they are easy easier to trick than mm-hmm. guys who are coming from from MMA or from yeah. from jiu-jitsu wrestling especially wrestling you know because they're used to to being tough and used to to um ex- extreme power and explosive speed so yeah but mm-hmm. but you know from from my perspective uh, for me it's interesting because i i'm i'm used to that kind of power but i've also realized that what arc is doing is is very different from that kind of power so for right. me that's a really interesting interesting thing to have both worlds and of course, respecting both worlds, but for my personal choice, you know, when you get older, it's not that appealing. The, the, the external brute force explosiveness stuff is not that appealing to me because that's something I only, I mean, I'm way past my prime. And even, even if I, I'm still strong and everything, it's nothing I can see myself getting better at in the next 10 or 15 or 20 years. But the stuff Ark is doing, you know, it's something I don't see, but that's something we could talk even later about. But I, I don't see uh, a limit in doing that in, in, in the next 10, 15, 20 years. And that's mm-hmm. what, what is appealing to me. And that's why I think it's it's, it's so interesting. Yeah. But like I said, we can talk about this later. So just, just continue. How you met yeah. how you met Art? Um so originally I met Ark really randomly because yeah, so I I wanted to continue Ely Chen at the time you know, because I found it really interesting. Mm-hmm. And I thought, here's a guy who doesn't hide anything. And, you know, um, and I want to do this internal stuff, but I also know a lot of the internals like require that you do these forms and do all these things. I was just like, yeah, I really don't give a crap. <laughs> just like, look, can we just get to the mechanics? Um, yeah. I actually visited a Qdo, um, a kudo class because i was interested in 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 kudo in like how they use the back and the mechanics and i was just can we just skip all the formalities and just get to straight to how you use your midsection and stuff and yeah that was i got kicked out of the class but um uh but anyways uh yeah back to arc i was looking for you know um a place that would train internals and i was under the impression that japanese didn't really have internal martial arts so yeah and i i actually went around a bunch of places so i so first i 
I went to a bunch of um, websites. ARC's site was linked off of the the Naika Kenkenkyukai or the Internal Martial Arts Club that he was originally a member of. And then mm -hmm. it said that he did Shingi and Sanda. And, and I was like, oh, Shingi and Sanda. So he does fighting, etc. So I called him up. I was like, look, uh, I really don't care about forms, but I'm more interested in the internals and like how it works. Uh, is that something that you do? And he was just like, huh, what? Internal way you, you look, just come over and touch hands. <laughs> it's quicker. And then that was the start. So he he didn't even even uh, thought much about himself as an internal teacher or something. He was just doing what he was doing. Yeah, I mean, you know, he was just like from the get go. He was he would say, you know, people talk about internal this and this is external. That is external. This is internal. He's like, dude, it's just a person moving their goddamn body. It's like, <laughs> yeah, and. There's an efficient way. There's not efficient. There are obvious ways. There are not so obvious ways. And he's like, and and some things require that you not be dumb when you do things. And my teacher told you, look, if you're going to do this stuff, you can't be dumb. Yeah. So. So what 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 was your training like in the beginning days, in the early days? Um, it sucked. It was hard. <laughs> it's like because he he had us do like. A lot of these, um, the Chinese would call it jibengong, or foundational training. Mm -hmm. And he took some of it from his Chinese background. Um, so a lot of the, you, you hold your arms in a cross and you raise the the legs in different directions. Yeah, I saw that on the first DVD, I think. The first, the early uh, uh, Ankai DVDs was all there, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, but he emphasized that you didn't want to just go for height and oh so i so i was like oh i know these exercises because chris had us do it he had us do uh -huh. the, the jibengong and like i could kick my leg like past my past my ear at the time and then uh -huh. he's looking at me and he's like cracking up he's like he's like he's like he's just, he's just like laughing at me i have no he's like what but that's the point he's like uh-huh 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 uh yeah, so don't do it like that. He's like your upper body is bending to meet the 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 leg. Don't do mm -hmm. that. He's like only raise the leg as high as you can, and keep the chest um, yeah. straight. Keep the spine straight. Don't raise the leg at the expense of your posture, um, bending over. And he's like, most people that do wushu they do it exactly like that. They they just try to go for height and flexibility. Yeah, that's that's not the point. So lots of um, single exercises, uh, solo exercises in the in the early days, mm -hmm. and some some partnered training too, but uh, a little bit of push hands, um, aikiage or uh, agite agite training, seated agite training. We did some mitt work with kicks, so we would uh, do uh, low kicks, mid kicks, uh, side kicks. Mm -hmm. Um, and generally he thought high kicks were useless for, from a mm. practical application. So we never drilled them. Mm. Okay. So what you would say changed over the years in, in terms of training, uh, in, in the class and training for, for ARC himself, when you compare 2003 to 2023 what what is the main difference in the way he's teaching and the way he is training mm -hmm. for himself um that's a good question uh you know because i think at the beginning you know he was what he had to do was you know he realized none of us had um good conditioning we didn't have connection so his main focus was on just putting us through the, you know, building up conditioning, uh, building up connection. Um, and that took like a good, I want to say four to five years. Um, that was his main focus. But, um, and then gradually uh, he evolved as well. Like, um, like the 
first time I met him, I think he relied more on his just rote conditioning, although he did have what I guess um, some people would refer to as Aiki. Mm -hmm. It wasn't it wasn't refined at the time. And so we got to see him go through kind of a metamorphosis where he evolved and it went from his focus went from conditioning and trying to like uh, condition different parts of the body and the connection to how to use those connections. Um, and he would gradually move to more sophisticated usages. And so actually by the time he visited Germany and we saw you for the first time, he was already changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He was already, he was already shifting. So uh, his training, the way he's training his students changed also, you would say, yes. over the last 20 years, more yes. to more refined stuff and, and um, um, more applications. Because yeah. in the beginning, we had no applications. It was it was all you mean, te technical wise, uh, co combative applications or mm, not much. I mean, like he, he had me enter like these Sanda tournaments and uh -huh. he's just like, just kick and punch stuff <laughs> like well i mean he i mean he got us ready with like mitt work and stuff but um the the i guess the application work that you see him do these days that was non-existent and that wasn't until he started training the french that um the french people that he really started to think about applications so you would say that the applications are a combination of his his technical training he did before plus his his internal training and his his internal progress over the last years. Yes, yes, I would say so. Although he could always move. He had a very high technical level in terms of being able to do technique and but mm -hmm. that was just never his focus when he was initially training us because he felt that just wasn't really important in the beginning um in the long run um that if you were going to do these techniques you needed a strong solid body to be able to pull them off mm -hmm. so what you would say technical wise is it more striking is it more kicking is it more mm -hmm. joint locking like aikido is it more wrestling stuff what would you what you would describe oh. the technical applications of of Aon Kai in the training with others? Um, this is a good question. That's a hard question. Um, it's, well, first off, I guess the best way to understand it is that all of his applications are derived from weapons work. And by that, I mean, mm -hmm. like, it's the use of the sword. It's going to be like the use of the spear etc so two-handed weapons work a lot a lot of two-handed weapons work yeah in fact mm -hmm. he's very plainly stated that his the the connections that he developed and the skill that he developed was um mostly developed by the by the six foot staff that he uses mm -hmm. uh, and he learned so he learned these basic I guess you could say um, staff strikes and movement drills designed to create the posture within the body to understand how to manipulate a load. Um, and he studied those really deeply. And then he combined his understanding from those staff exercises that he learned from his Koryu teacher uh, with some of the, you know, the Chinese applications that he learned while he was studying in the, the, Chinese martial arts school. Mm -hmm. So still, uh, weapons training is still part of of the regular training in in, in, yes. in Aonkai or yes. yes, okay, very but much so. mostly focus on on two handed work, not single single knife or single sword or something. Mostly two handed stuff. Yeah, mo mostly two handed, mostly two handed stuff. So you know, we have single handed applications. But to understand yeah. how the single hand application works, you have to understand how the the blade works. So mm -hmm. one one application he'll he'll often give is like if somebody hits a showman, 
And uh -huh. we do this one where just like in Shintajiku, you just raise your arm up so that as the person hits the showman, it just slides off of you and you use the friction mm -hmm. to turn your body. Oh, we mean, yeah. Right. Yeah. But yeah, the genesis for that is not well, you see this, but the genesis for that is that you have a two handed sword. Uh, you you you're manipulating a sword and all you do is you raise that sword directly up on your center line. If you take away mm -hmm. this hand, it's just this. Yeah. So if if somebody were to cut down on you, you raise your sword, and this it's this motion, then that turns into the single handed applications. Mm -hmm. And I think with the with the with the double handed applications, you create a, more of a kind of a symmetry because you know your 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 shoulders have to move, and mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's it's more. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything else about the early days or your your start of the training or something interesting you remember from your from your training oh, in the there's, beginning there's, or there's plenty of interesting things. Not everything can be said on here. <laughs> this is a lot of drinking. <laughs> there was a, actually there there was a there was a lot of knowledge he imparted um, after training. Yeah, I think like. I want I I honestly I want to say like 70% of our training was like afterwards because he would just go off on these like diatribes on you know and he's like what is balance you know he'd be drunk and he'd say some kind of crass joke or something but it would but it was there was always like a twist and there was always he was always thinking about um I guess like the physics of what's involved and he's like look the only reason that a that a person is able to be unbalanced is because they stand on two legs if you are a tripod if you had a tripod you'd be super stable right so yeah. um he's like even sagawa said the only reason aiki works is because it's a human because we have because we stand on two legs if you were the terminator it wouldn't work at all yeah yeah so because hmm. yeah that reminds me on the story i at our, our first uh, seminar with art when when he took me down with with three fingers and he i mean i had this very light shirt you know nothing mm -hmm. just basic shirt and he took me with three fingers and he threw me through the room and i was flying around but when i got up i was thinking man my shirt is not ripped so if he took me down if he would use typical outside strengths he would just have ripped my shirt off but he did not rip my shirt off he just manipulated my my sense of balance or maybe my nervous system whatever to to do what he wants me doing you know and that's pretty pretty interesting and that's something um i i uh, experienced with with um, a few of the internal guys something that is really uh, a topic that 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 uh, goes through all these these things but i think that's that's something for our next for our next episode to talk about what is Aiki and how Aiki really works and right. all that stuff. I think there's a lot of stuff we can cover and we can talk about. So uh, mm -hmm. maybe we should save that for for our next episodes or something. Sure, sure, sure. There's a there's a lot of ground to cover there. You bring up a good point because it's Aiki. Like we can cover this next time, but it's not just um, depend on the. I guess you could say like the conditioning and stuff. There is mm -hmm. a thing where you're, you are messing with the other person's ability to sense forces. So you're messing with their brain essentially. Yeah. You're hacking yeah. their brain. And that, that's yeah. part of what makes it work. Yeah. Yeah. That's deep and interesting topic. I think we should, should go to into this next time because it's really, an, really interesting effects and, um, practical applications for 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 uh, every martial artist who is who is interested in, in in expanding the way he is operating i would say so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep so yeah and i would say let's let's wrap it up okay and, uh thank you for the talk and see you next time i would say yep sounds good all right catch you later bjorn